All right, welcome back, everyone. This is um, the next session of the day is going to be on the state of litigation. We have a very distinguished panel that has um, prepared a, uh, a session that we're really revolving around a discussion, which I hope in turn will turn into a debate, which will then turn into a fight, which will then turn into just mass chaos. So if anyone wants to see some mass chaos, we might build a ring and um, just get really, really crazy. But And then secondly, I thought if the room doesn't fill up too much, we could all just move outside and just do this outside. And so we are in Southern California and why are we sitting in a hotel hall when we're in Southern California? So, on that note, I am John Coletti. I am the uh, moderator for this session. I'm an underwriter at XL Catlin. Um, and to my left are four attorneys. I'm not an attorney. And so they're going to do most of the talking, and I'm going to provoke them into debate. To my left is Mr. John Yakunis from Morgan and Morgan. We're gonna, just going to classify him as the bad guy, okay? You want to read his bio, you can do that. Lindsay Nickel is to John's left. She is going to be sort of the good moderator, like, you know, the, the, the fixer, the, right? Someone that comes in. I'm the peacemaker, with, right? The peacemaker, the peacemaker, right? So Lindsay's left is, is Ron Rather. Ron's a good guy, okay? I mean, literally, I'm a good guy. He's the good guy. <laughs> And then to Ron's left is Alex Cameron, and Alex is the Canadian. The, the real peacekeeper. The real peacekeeper. Okay, you need to know nothing more about these four people than that. If you want to read their bios, go right ahead. So the state of litigation. Now this is where the, the conversation is going to kind of change a little bit, and it's, we're going to get into like, kind of like the gory details of data breach. And a lot of the discussion so far has centered around data breach costs and crisis costs and dealing with the regulators and, you know, and, and business interruption and that sort of stuff. But the question that, is, that was often raised to me about, you know, what is my worst fear and what is your, you know, your doomsday scenario for being an, a, a cyber insurer, I, I've, I've always go back and say, well, the litigation has gone pretty well so far. But what if something changes, right? What if the litigation landscape significantly changes and all these cases that are really being dismissed so far, what if the case law changes a little bit and all these cases become really costly class actions that are really hard to get dismissed and you end up in, in, in settlement and you end up in, in court in a lot of these cases. So, you know, is that is what, what is, could that be happening right now? I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but before we get into sort of the changes, I think we need to maybe spend some time just talking about class action cases, right? Data breach occurs, we all know that there, it's almost inevitable that there's gonna be a class action lawsuit that's gonna be filed. Um, and then, you know, what's, what happens after that, the, there's, you know, the, the, the you know, the defense is going to try and get that case dismissed. And there's been some really good case law so far that has been getting those cases dismissed. That's it's the Clapper versus Amnesty International case. And before we get into this thing called Neiman Marcus, which is going to really take up a lot of our discussion, I was just wondering if, if Ron could just explain what was the Supreme Court's ruling in Clapper and why has that case been so important and replied upon in getting data breach classes dismissed? Sure. Uh, so, so Clapper is actually really interesting, and I think it helps to have a, a real quick timeline in terms of uh, the issue and what we've been dealing with for the last 10, 15 years in, in privacy in data breach litigation. Um, so the question really is whether a plaintiff has the right to come into court and invoke the jurisdiction of the court. Right? So in order for, to do that, what the Supreme Court has said is that you either have to have an actual injury um, or you have to have a substantial risk uh, of injury in order for the court to have what's called Article III um, standing. And early on in the litigation, I think DSW in 2006 was probably one of the first decisions that came out of Ohio where the court said, you know, when somebody has been uh, given notice of an event, they don't necessarily at that point have an injury. So I, we don't have Article III standing and so we're going to dismiss. 
And, and the, the law sort of developed, and as I've said before, we have to watch judges and juries because uh, we all get a, a get out of jail free card the first time, and I think as an industry we did in those early 2006, um, 2007 cases. And then Krotner, Starbucks came along and some other cases which said, you know what, when somebody is given a, a breach event notice, uh, they at least have the concern that somebody's doing something wrong um, with their, uh, some, someone's doing something wrong with their information. That's a concrete injury. So we're going to find standing. Then we we moved for uh, dismissal on the, you know, at least the common law claims that even though you may have an injury for standing, you don't have an actual injury to bring a negligence claim and started winning those motions. And then Clapper came along, which was a Supreme Court decision involving the Privacy Act. Uh, and in that case, the plaintiffs um, essentially tried to fabricate a claim. I mean, that's probably being a little too harsh, but that's essentially what they did. They went out and, and tried to create an injury under the Privacy Act. What the Supreme Court said is you can't create your own injury, um, so um, we're not going to find concrete injury, we're not going to find standing. Clapper came out and it gave us all a new opportunity on the defense bar to raise the Article III challenge again. Uh, and so that's sort of where we get to uh, in terms of setting the stage for Neiman Marcus. Right, and I think there have been some um, decisions that have contradicted or have gone slightly against the uh, Article III standing um, argument. Um, but I think, by and large, do we all agree that this uh, concrete and imminent injury has been, a, you know, has been good law, right, and has been um, been used by the defense in getting these cases largely uh, dismissed? Is that we could all agree to that? Well, I, mean, I think there's been a, a mixture, yeah. frankly, in, in the case law of, of some, some decisions. They're actually the Paulsonelli decision now of the Seventh Circuit, um, which is the same place that Neiman Marcus came from. Uh, in, that in that decision, which I think was pre-Clapper, John, I don't, I don't, that's my recollection. Um, but they were, you know, the Seventh Circuit then was saying as well that uh, there can be an imminent threat of injury uh, just on the basis of the risk, the inherent and increased risk caused by the event itself. I think what's interesting, in, you know, and we'll get to Neiman Marcus in a second, there are some really what I consider bizarre aspects of that decision where the judge went above and beyond to justify his ruling that I think creates yeah. bad law. Okay. So, um, so I think now's a good time that we should, we should talk about the Neiman Marcus ruling, right? And I think, John, um, if you could explain the Seventh Circuit's ruling in overturning the U.S. District Court in Neiman, sure. Neiman Marcus. So I'm co-lead counsel in that case, so I will be uh, very circumspect in my comments since the case is now back on remand to the U.S. District So you judge. agree with me the judge went too far in his decision? The district judge? Um, <laughs> no, no, the, the Seventh Circuit. That the Seventh, Seventh Circuit, Circuit They kind of messed it up, right? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I think the Seventh Circuit got it right. Um, this injury in fact argument is, is uh, particularly since it's a lot of lawyers ground uh, their arguments on the defense side as well as court decisions which have dismissed cases on Clapper. I think Clapper is, is, is not a change in the Article III standing, nor is a Seventh Circuit uh, decision a change in the Article III standing. If you remember that privacy is in essence a 19th century concept, the law is just now beginning to catch up with technology. And I think the Seventh Circuit's opinion is a recognition that information once released uh, or taken by a hacker has a great uh, pro uh, propensity to cause injury. Um, these uh, cases John, which have... I'm sorry, can you just table set for everyone. To just give them a little bit of a background on, on Neiman Marcus. What, what data was stolen, the amounts, just just so they have some sort of concept of what, sure. you know, what we're talking about. So uh, Neiman Marcus is a PCI data breach. It was payment card information, uh, information pertaining to both uh, Neiman Marcus credit card holders and those who came and shop in Neiman Marcus stores. And there certainly uh, has been, following a PCI breach, an uptick in the amount of uh, consumer fraud. Our client in that case did not have a misuse of uh, their card, but had a concern that their information was now in the hands of a hacker, and we allege that that person not only had uh, standing, but it was grounded upon the fact that their information still remained in the possession 
of Neiman Marcus. Certainly it had been taken. There was a likelihood that it would be used, and I'll talk about that in a, uh, a, a moment, but we argued that they still had an interest to protect that information going forward, and I think that's going to be an emerging argument that you're going to see from lawyers who are on the plaintiff side, and I think you're going to see a, a, a now uh, shift away from Clapper, and we're not going to be losing motions to dismiss. Um, remember, in class litigation, we seek uh, different types of certification, B3 and B2, C4. Uh, on B2 and C4 certification, I've not lost a motion to dismiss, and I won't because I believe people who had their information taken have a right to ensure that their information that remains in the hands of a, uh, of a company so, so is, John, is just so that everybody knows, B2 is when you're just pursuing injunctive relief? Correct. And C4 is when you want to try a, a discrete issue as opposed to the entire case? Correct. So in, in, in that regard, what we're seeking is the court to certify a class where we're asking the court to certify single issues such as that the defendant had the information, that the defendant's loss of the information was negligent. And that's a pretty easy standard for me to reach presently. I think you got the people in this audience are going to change that, make it more difficult for me as security becomes a lot tighter. Uh, but Neiman Marcus, in the landscape of what I do, is a game changer. And the panel was impressed with the fact that information was out in the the possession of hackers on the black market and could cause damage, particularly one of the judges who began, I think, to think about during the oral argument. And, and if you look, read the transcript, you'll see she's concerned about her own information. <laughs> and, I'll, uh, and, and I know it's early, but can I talk about an experience I had last week? Absolutely. So um, I'm in this it's space. Not personal, is it? No, 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 no. So I file a lot of data breach cases. I, I, I can't get them out the door quick enough because I've, I've been in this area for a number of years and Ron and I had a privacy case for many years that I know both he and I are proud of the result, even though it was a resolved result, it wasn't one that um, we lost. But I was in New York last week before the Digital Panel on Multi-District Litigation. It's a panel of federal judges who periodically come together in one place to hear petitions filed by a party seeking to centralize and transfer litigation, like litigation, to one forum. So for instance, typically mass torts uh, or class actions are filed in mass. Anthem was 118 cases. The panel will decide, based upon oral argument from the lawyers, where the cases ought to go, whether they should be centralized or remain apart. And we know Anthem went to Judge Coe uh, who's been uh, a very progressive judge in San Jose, California. She decided the Adobe case, which the Seventh Circuit followed. But I was before this panel, and I was arguing for the Eastern District of Virginia, the rocket docket. The government, Department of Justice, and Key Point uh, was arguing for the case to be sent to, or cases, to be sent to the District of Columbia. Before the panel argument began, Judge Vance, the presiding judge, who's a U.S. District Judge in New Orleans, declared, she caucused with the judges on her left and right and declared a state of necessity. She declared that because each of those judges are members of the putative class. Each of those judges have had their information taken. And if you've been following the public press about OPM, it started out with a small number of federal employees' information, and it's grown now to an excess of 22 million. What's important about OPM is they first acknowledged that there had been 1.1 million fingerprints. It's now up to 5 million. I have four former FBI agents in my office who assist me in, in investigating facts in the cases I bring. They've received notice that their information was taken. Now, they're all retired, but the active FBI agents I have a client who is a former DE, well, excuse me, a present DE agent undercover in the Far East. His information has been taken. He got a letter. He's now trying to decide whether or not with the DEA he can go back and do undercover work in the Far East. Probably not. So I'm, before these federal judges, I'm, I'm the last one to speak before the Department of Justice has a rebuttal. And each of them, I think, had an aha moment. 
about the importance of privacy. They, I was arguing for the rocket docket. I said in the DC circuit, it takes an average of 36.7 months to get a case from file to trial. In the Eastern District of Virginia, right across the Potomac, where Key Point is based, it takes 10.7. One of the judges said, Mr. Yanchunas, do you think this case can be placed on a rocket docket? I said, Your Honor, it has to be. Judges in my judicial district in Tampa, federal judges have received phishing emails from OPM, allegedly, seeking their information to sign up for the identity theft protection. They're fake. Judges are already experiencing the very, same thing, the very things that they were once presiding as uh, judges, as neutrals. They're not neutrals anymore. Sounds like a worse nightmare. It, it for... <laughs> I mean, for, from my perspective. You know, it, so, it, so it, how, you know, what are the, what are the judges going to do in terms of being able to find somebody that can hear that case? Was that decided? Well, the class... So we, we obviously certify... No, it, it, it'll be, we'll get an opinion this week. You're going to get the, the judge week. that's appointed like next week? Um, whose fingerprints weren't yet in the system? Well, there'll be, a, but what we've drafted, and, and Ron knows this, we, we, we draft our class so that we exclude any presiding judge or his staff, his or her staff, and any judge to whom the case will be assigned. So, John, John do you think that with the standing issue, you know, we, we can, there, there's certainly, I think, instances, and there was at least, I think, one named plaintiff in Neiman Marcus that the court found did not have standing? Correct. Right, and and so substantial ri increased risk of injury still. I mean, that was the Krotner law, that was the Policini <laughs> standard, and I think that's what Neiman Marcus said. But th that's not really the end of the battle for you all, right? Because you still have to, if you're bringing a negligence claim, you still have to prove actual damages. Uh, well, to the extent, however, I argue that a person has standing to ensure that the information that res remains in the possession of the defendant has an interest in ensuring that it's well protected. I think the standing argument is based upon the fact that the information still resides in the possession of the defendant. This stuff isn't taken. And, and, so it becomes and an injunctive relief claim and not really a damages claim? Correct. And, and I, I think I've been pretty open about the fact that my, my interest in this litigation is privacy protection. I mean, damages are obviously a necessary element, but I'm more concerned about making certain the information remains protected going forward. So I, I have not lost that argument by arguing that approach to standing. So how are you dealing with the Duke v. Walmart, uh, you know, post-Allison test of predominance or incidental? So, so, there's, so, so under B2, if uh, the class has a claim for actual damages and you're trying to litigate just on the basis of injunctive relief only, and you're trying to squeeze that into B2, um, Duke's v. Walmart actually came out and, and, I, and the Supreme Court there was dealing with the question of whether you could have a B-2 class in a fair labor FLSA case, which is an opt-in case. And, and what the Supreme Court ultimately said was, in a B-2 case, if there, we can debate this, right? Whether there are damages at all, you may not be able to ever have a B-2. Um, Pre-Dukes, pre it was a predominance, which, which predominates injunctive relief or damages. Post-Dukes, it's now incidental. Are damages incidental to injunctive relief? I think best case for trying to get a B2. So I've not had so, to fight that argument yet. I, I, um, so maybe we'll get a chance to do that. Uh, well, it's been my experience that I've settled every one of the cases I filed. I think companies find it more advantageous uh, for their customer base to come up with a remedy by agreement than one that might be forced down upon them uh, in the target um, that, that right there is a perspective comment. It that is. Companies find it advantageous. And, and this, and particularly from a defense perspective, one of the things that concerns me about the result of Neiman Marcus is that the effort put forward by very fine lawyers to win the result they wanted in that case may have ramifications on other cases that actually end up reducing the amount of protection to the consumers. That's the biggest concern I have from it. And, and it's not unusual. I mean, we see it in the law all the time that a particular result of a particular case um, has long-term ramifications that end up becoming negative. That's the big concern I have. Is, that so bad so facts make bad to, law. Just, yeah, explain, yes. explain and, how, and, how that And can particularly, happen. and, and the, the part of it that I've focused on, you know, personally from my perspective, is the idea that you had a judge imply 
that there must be some sort of risk of harm because there was credit monitoring or identity <coughs> theft protection. And the implication there really demonstrated that the judges weren't given enough education about what they were being asked to rule on. And as lawyers from both sides of the bench, we have an obligation to educate the judges that we're in front of, and, but we have to do it in a very a finite space, whether it's on paper and writing or in oral arguments or in arguments um, for motions. And what's clear about that is the idea that there is an implication because of what the market has done and what particular statutes may require. You know, we're going to offer credit monitoring. We're going to offer identity restoration. We are going to offer something to these consumers because, because number one, it may be customary, because there may be a statutory requirement, because we, we want our business to recover. We want to have a goodwill gesture. We want to show these customers that we're doing something for them and to have the judges imply, well, they wouldn't have done it if there wasn't a risk of harm. Um, is it, The effect of that could actually mean that these very consumers that lawyers are advertising and claiming and saying that they want to protect receive less protection as time goes on. So, I haven't so, read the briefs, so, John. Did you, so, uh, did you argue that? No. I, I, I've, I've seen one judge um, I think Judge Magnuson raised it in response to a, our argument on the motion to, to dismiss. Um, I, I don't see that. Uh, and, you know, there are companies out, out, outside that, uh, you know, the vendors that offer that. I mean, I, I think that is a, 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 a good response. I'm a consumer myself. Typically, five or six times a year, I have to get new debit or credit cards. Uh, I travel a great deal around this country, and, and I'm the subject of a lot of that uh, identity theft. So you might um, just have a target on your back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably do. Uh, Unintended. So, well, but I'm, I think I'm the, guessing. I think it was just, the, the Seventh oh, Circuit ruled that the uh, the Neiman the Marcus offered one year of credit monitoring identity theft protection as a reason for concluding that the risk of harm is not so ephemeral that it can be safely disregarded. I guess your concern, Lindsay, is that and I don't. Well, there's any breach counsel in, in the room, but. Could you argue and say, well, maybe you shouldn't provide credit monitoring? Well, we're already seeing that used. discussion. We're, we are getting that discussion from clients in breach response. We're getting that question. It's the discussion among, among breach response counsel. Well, wait a second. Why should we do this? Because the effect is that someone is going to take that goodwill gesture that, you know, you know, Connecticut now requires it, they're going to take that gesture and they're going to turn it into an argument that you are self-proving standing for your plaintiffs because you're doing something that should benefit the consumer. And it's, it's, a, it's a situation that these organizations shouldn't be put in. And it misunderstands and it actually highlights the misunderstanding between what happens in, in, in the wake of a credit card theft, a PCI breach, and what happens when identity theft is at issue. Those aren't the same thing. And judges don't understand that. And frankly, consumers don't really understand it very well. Um, and so to have that effect, I mean, it's already, that's already splashing back. It's already affecting how organizations are responding to breaches and they're questioning what the right choice is in a situation where really it should be the best choice for the business and the consumer. I mean, it almost seemed to me that it was one of those cases where the judge was going, the judge, the, the panel was going above and beyond to try to justify their conclusion. Exactly. And, and, and it's interesting for me to hear, John, because I hadn't had a chance to read the briefs that you guys didn't even argue that. So, the, you know, the court kind of came up with that on their own. And I think that's remarkable. And it's also, I think, a good education point for us uh, going forward to not over necessarily overreact to that aspect of Neiman Marcus and in, in, in how we counsel our clients. What I mean, the, the other thing that, that's interesting to me in the Neiman Marcus is that they had three chances. I think that this was the third time that the same event had happened uh, in terms of their cybersecurity. It was a third. They had a cybersecurity issue, right? And it was the third time that it had happened. Um, and, and so it was on this third occasion that your your plaintiffs were were asserting the claims about, right? Right. And, and, and those, and I th how, I thought that those, the fact, that when I said bad facts make bad law, right, so you have a company that try, had three times to get it right and the third time it didn't, and now is arguing the absence of standing and, and injury. I, did that play, do you think that played into, oh, it, into the argument? Absolutely. That, that was an easy question. Absolutely. And, and, and the same thing with Target and uh, Home Depot, where I'm co-lead. Uh, bad facts in both those cases for the two defendants that we, we sued. 
um, and even OPM. I was before the panel last week, and um, one judge asked whether or not OIG was the appropriate uh, government uh, agency to continue to monitor the way OPM held information. I said, not if you read our complaint. OIG had given OPM any number of reasons to tighten up security, and they ignored them. And of course, the OPM director is no longer there. They replaced her. And um, I said, what you need now is judicial oversight. And every one of those judges were looking at me, obviously concerned about their own personal information now out uh, in the uh, black market. Can anyone have any questions about, about Nina Marcus? <coughs> You know, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think the, the gut response from a breach response perspective has been, wait a second, you know, if we offer these services, are we acquiescing that these folks suffered harm? Even if we've done a complete risk of harm analysis and say, we don't think there is any risk, but we're going to offer these services for business purposes or for whatever reason drives them. Um, I, I actually, to, to kind of answer your question with an antidote, I sat on a panel last week um, with a district judge and we were talking about the effect of Neiman Marcus and one of the things he said about it is that he thinks it means that companies that have evidence that they're being attacked have to respond to that and have to raise the standard of their security and if they don't that it's going to result in greater liability. It was a great oversimplification. To some extent he's right though. and and when you're looking at a question of negligence, when you're looking at a question of what is a, what would a reasonable company do in this situation, I think a little bit of the opposite of that is true. And that the, one of the effects of Neiman Marcus and some of the other cases and the greater understanding about this space is that when, when you aren't responding appropriately to historical incidents, then you face greater liability. That the response is actually critically important um, because that's what reasonable companies should do, is respond to attacks, respond to feedback that they're getting that their security needs to be greater. Um, th the flip side of this particular si situation is the idea that, that there may be more than one reason for why a company will offer monitoring and remediation, and that wasn't taken into account. That it's not just risk of harm and it's not just injury that is the driving force for providing that to consumers. So, uh, you know, I haven't made that argument in, on standing, but, you know, Rule 407, I think that's the rule, pro prohibits the introduction of subsequent remedial measures to prove the negligence. It can be used for other reasons, mm -hmm. uh, enumerated Yeah, but it's feasibility is one of them, too. Yeah. Right? So, but I think what's really interesting about your question is nobody's litigating the issue of reasonable standards. Right, so if the case gets past the motion to dismiss stage, and we've talked about this for years if you've been coming to these conferences, that companies aren't uh, in a position to be able to put forward a good argument on their reasonable procedures. They're not doing the work up front to make sure that they have a, you know, a chief information security officer in place, that they have a good risk mitigation plan, that they have the, you know, a good incident response plan, they have the right documentation in place, the right controls that they've documented their information security efforts in a controlled way. By that I mean, you know, you know, the IT people aren't emailing themselves back and forth sent, making great blow-ups for John uh, in the liability phase. And, and, and John and I were actually talking about this, that it's, it, those issues aren't getting litigated because um, my clients and companies out there aren't in a position, they're not prepared to start to, be, to litigate these questions. And I even asked John, how many cases have you gotten, you know, into discovery where you're getting those emails? Right. None. None. Uh, and you know, this is kind of interesting what Ron just mentioned because when I negotiate settlements, lawyers are constantly thinking about the dollars as is their clients. And uh, again, I, I so my focus is on in the injunctive relief, better protecting the information. And, and, and that message gets mixed up. And last week I was in negotiation <coughs> of a very large data breach and the lawyer was pushing back, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that. And I'm thinking, we're a partner here in better protecting uh, your customers and my clients' information. 
and we shouldn't be arguing about this. Oh yes, PCI doesn't require that, but best practices do. And why wouldn't you put that in place? And I got this typical lawyer pushback, thinking we're not going to do that. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, see you the next time we settle this case. I'll see that's you our, again. That's our job to negotiate. But yeah, but but, but, but it does. Question. But it does. It does. It does actually. Ra you know, it does actually raise a you know question that I get when cases come in, and that's should we make this change now, or should we save it as something to offer in settlement? And I think that's an, an even more interesting and challenging question. And 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 what's even you know. I, I make light of this, but in terms of what can be offered in an injunctive relief settlement package, um, because of what's been happening in states like Connecticut and the like, that menu of potential options is starting to shrink and is starting to focus in on making you know information security controls as part of an injunctive relief, um, which which adds all kinds of elements that you know John and I have negotiated and dealt with in other cases of. You know, I certainly don't, you know, no offense, John, but I don't want you coming to my client two years from now and asking me, you know, can I see the documents to make sure you're in compliance with the injunctive relief program? And, you know, we've thought, we've, we, we've thought through that issue and we've come up with what I think is an acceptable um, compromise on that. But, it, you know, it's going to require, I think, some creative thinking and, and, and coming up with, uh, you know, how, you know, how do, how do, you know, what do we do at the beginning in the middle of dealing, you know, when you're in the middle of dealing with the breach response, and, and you're required to make remedial changes, you know, you know, do we put some of those in our back pocket that we can offer as injunctive relief later on? You know, it's easy for me as a litigator to say that. It's harder for me to convince the CISO or the breach response people who have to then go and talk with AGs or OCR that, that that's, a good, that's a good idea. For another question? You know, to me, it depends. I think the problem is, is that too many companies are offering credit monitoring where, where it has no relevance at all to the data or the event at issue. So for, let me give you an example. If, if my uh, personal health information is stolen, so that, you know, the fact that you guys know I'm on some medication, how is, a credit, how is credit monitoring going to help me with, you know, protect myself against somebody knowing that, you know, I'm on ADD medicine? I know you all, you all probably guessed that, right? Um, <laughs> You know, how is that going to help? And, and I think you were making it, that point earlier. Right, and it, it's, it's, a, it's an offshoot of the idea that we have not just a judiciary that doesn't fully understand the issue, but also a consumer base that doesn't fully understand. Um, and even, you know, one of the best examples is Connecticut. You know, well, we want a minimum of one year, but we want two years of credit monitoring. Well, how does that help in this situation? We don't care. That's what we want. We're going to demand it. Please do this for us. Um, so I, I think it is case by case. I, th I think from the aspect of the risk management piece, that if, if you have a client face facing a breach and you're looking at the risk of litigation, the very real risk, I mean, if, if not almost a certainty at this point, um, you know, Ron's right. Some, some of it is remedial because you have a breach response responsibility and you have regulatory issues that you have to deal with. It, deal with. Some of it may be something you want to save to offer as a negotiating package. But the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about litigation in this space, we're really talking about jockeying for negotiating position. Um, we're not at a point where the law is developed enough to actually be able to say, well, we know how the courts are going to view this action as opposed to this action. We know how reasonableness is going to be defined and what the standard is going to look like. Some of that we just don't know. And so it's about recognizing that with Neiman Marcus, what has happened is plaintiffs have bought themselves more time to negotiate. So, you know, one of the things that, um, and I'll, I'll just add something to both those comments about the type of information is taken. Uh, probably all of you are aware of something called synthetic identities, where information is cobbled together from various sites as well as what it's taken to create identities. So the fact that PHI may be the only thing taken, there's things within PHI that can build upon uh, a synthetic identity that a thief can go and uh, take out credit um, or incur debt. So I'm not here to, to, to uh, push a product, but... Because then how do you deal with the causation issues? Well, right? so, okay. So, so here's gotta, what I did. Well, I have one big suit of everyone who's been breached in the last six months. Or? So I uh, have met with Albert Gonzalez uh, several times, who's in Leavenworth. Uh, you can look it up. He's serving uh, more time than probably uh, many of us will be alive. Uh, he's one of the most uh, prolific.
hackers. And I met with him along with somebody who I use who's, uh, I, uh, who's worked black ops for most of his career. Who's the hacker behind TJX and some of the Yes, hackers. yes. Yep. So I wanted to understand better my job in protecting my consumers. So with Mr. Gonzalez's help, obviously he's trying to get something out of me and, and, and that's uh, less time perhaps by helping <coughs> consumers who he preyed upon for decades. And with my black ops expert, I can go into the black market and I can find information taken and for sale and by running um, a certain algorithm, which in part depends upon the information I get from the defendant, I can tell what tranches of information came from Neiman Marcus, what came from Target, what came from Home Depot. Now, at some point, it may become difficult, but right now, it isn't that difficult for me to establish causation. I've never had to litigate that. You're doing that based on the metadata? And the metadata is not being... It's based upon the way that thieves aggregate information. So in Target... So they're adding tags to say this came from Target? No, no, no. no. So what they'll, they'll, they'll do is, it's so simple. They'll take all the debit and credit cards that were taken from Target and they'll throw them out there. And you can see sim similarities in that information. I mean, there are a bunch of numbers, but, I, but we've been able to say that those numbers came from uh, Target. Because remember, in Target and Home Depot, the banks also filed uh, class actions against those two retailers. So we have cooperation agreements with the consumers and the financial institutions to determine where that information came from. But that presumes that that credit card was only compromised at Target and not anywhere else. But the credit card is also, a, yes, that's, that's true. At some point, that, that's true. I want to litigate that issue too. <laughs> <laughs> They were all in denial. I mean, that's the reality. It's real. Not PCI. That's that's yeah. got to be out there on the market because people, you know banks Cards change those numbers difficult. so quickly. Anthem and some uh, o OPM. And it's going to be a little bit more difficult because, say for instance, children whose social security numbers were taken. No credit reporting agency is reporting any activity on children, so that's going to be warehoused for 15 or 18 years, and that's when it's like kind of asbestos, which I used to do on, on the coverage side. Um, you know, the manifestation will be 15, 16, 17 years ago. And for the insurance carriers, that's going to be an interesting, uh, but I guess you're all claims made instead of um, um, the, the older type of policies. Occurrence. Occurrence. Occurrence, thank you. I did that for 10 years, I forgot. <laughs> Go ahead. This has been a question on my mind most of the morning for some reason. It's fascinating to hear you talk about the fact that the Department of Justice is trying to My, my question for you guys, and question in general, is do we really have any evidence that credit monitoring, not just in some cases, but in any case, uh, actually has any benefit for people? Besides from padding the pockets of the right. vendors that are so, but, but it, you, know, I, you know, so we can get into a very, you know, ideological debate, right? So I, I think that the, the, really, the real movement is that people have to, you know, to me is that consumers have to be responsible for themselves. And unfortunately, we have a system that doesn't create individual responsibility, right? So if my card gets hacked um, and somebody steals my Visa card, I don't have it, you know, who cares? I'm not on the hook as a consumer. I don't have to pay that amount. And I think the pro, you know, so I, credit monitoring works if you actually monitor what's going on um, in, in your credit file. It doesn't work if, if you don't do it. And, and I think it works uh, only, in a certain, only, in a, only, only as a red flag. 
and it only works in a very limited um, set of markets. And, and there are there are different circumstances under which that I think it does bring value, and this brings us back to the earlier question of being a bit more judicious in choosing when it might be appropriate. Um, there are, you know, circumstances with stolen social security numbers being used for tax fraud. You know, those types of monitoring and remediation services really can help a consumer in that situation. Um, but when it very quickly becomes a standard and then that standard comes with certain inferences that may be incorrect, that's where you realize that you're dealing with consumers that aren't taking personal responsibility and really aren't as educated either. But there are circumstances where I think it does. Universally, I, I think that that, I think it's probably true that it doesn't, not as a universal thing. Okay. All right, everyone exhale for a minute. Uh, we're going to talk, give Alex a, a, an opportunity. He came here from Toronto, so um, I think we're all aware of the, the Ashley Madison breach is, was, uh, they're a Canadian company and they, they've been sued in, in Ontario. Um, so maybe Alex, you could just give us a little bit of background about what's going on in, in Canadian privacy law and uh, what hurdles the plaintiffs have in, that, in the class actions against Ashley Madison. Sure. Um, it's really interesting actually listening to the discussion on the U.S. side because um, Canada has greatly simplified these issues for plaintiffs, um, unfortunately for the defense. So, um, you know, I've been doing privacy and litigation for 15 years and really up until 2010 there was virtually no litigation activity in this area. 2010 you started to see individual plaintiffs come forward with, with claims and were getting modest awards. Since 2013 in particular it's skyrocketed and, and what's driving that is this very same issue of, you know, where you either have a challenge in proving harm or you, in fact, have had no harm, can you bring the, the claims forward? Our courts have, again and again, on individual plaintiff claims, ruled that the breach itself is sufficient. So you don't have to prove harm, you don't have to have damages, you're going to get some recovery even in the absence of harm. And just to highlight how crazy that has become, there was a BC, uh, court decision uh, about a month ago or so where a bank customer, Bank of Montreal customer, had her mailing address changed in the bank system. They couldn't explain why, but it was changed back to a, a former address. Uh, her ex-husband lived at that address and she was concerned and upset that he received her banking information, credit card and bank statements. His evidence, by the way, this first went through a commissioner investigation process and a seven-day trial to deal with this issue. Um, he said, I never opened it, I returned it unopened, and ultimately the judge found that that was the case. Absolutely no harm. So it's taken this long to get finally to court. The judge finds uh, on, on two grounds, both a, a statutory tort for invasion of privacy, which exists in British Columbia, and also on a contract analysis, so the, the conclusion being that the bank's privacy policies and procedures formed a part of the customer contract. Because there was a breach of contract, the court had the uh, ability to award nominal damages in the absence of harm. Nominal in this case, $2,000. Fine. One-off case, no problem. The bank can obviously, obviously absorb that. But that case is one of a growing number of these individual plaintiffs who've come forward and achieved recovery, which on the class side is creating a feeding frenzy of claims. So Ashley Madison, $750 million claim, uh, just prior to that against Bell Canada, $750 million claim, on the theory that with a big class, even at a, a, a modest sum, if you can get money for just the breach, terrific. So obviously it's going to drive settlement discussions at the class level, but the law's evolved in that way uh, that, that's created some real challenges. Uh, the other I issue which obviously is emerging, which many may have heard of, is on the statutory side, so we've had the introduction of uh, mandatory breach notification provisions in our d federal data protection law. Uh, those are now passed in law. They're not yet enforced, but they will be enforced in the coming months. Uh, they're, they're working on regulations now about content of notices and things like that. And the implications there are, are actually quite significant because the, the reporting obligation, uh, both to individuals and to the commissioner, 
uh, will kick in where there's a real risk of significant harm. So you come back to the, the question that we've been uh, considering, um, you know, for certain types of steps that are taken, are those going to come back and, and bite the defendants later? Well, the organization has to determine whether the incident has met that threshold. Is there a real risk of significant harm? Once they've made that determination, then they send out the notice. So you can see that when the litigation comes later, there was a, f a finding by the organization itself that there was a real risk of significant harm that's going to come back and bite them. So uh, that's, the, you know, on the, the short-term horizon. The other uh, sort of uh, troubling aspects of what's come in with the legislation is a mandatory uh, record-keeping obligation. So for every breach, a record must be kept. There's no threshold associated with that. And so the organizations are going to have to now have a breach file, which, by the way, the commissioner can come and ask to see at any time for any reason and publish. Uh, of course, uh, it, when it comes to litigation, that will be a prime target for discovery requests. You know, was this the 50th time you've had the same kind of incident? Uh, and any failure on either the notification, reporting, or record keeping uh, obligations uh, is an offense. So. Right now, we're working with a lot of clients to figure out how you're going to operationalize a lot of these to, to ensure that you know, you're going to get escalation uh, of suspected incidents up the chain to ensure that you are, you are meeting your obligations to notify and keep records. So, um, yeah, it's all very un-Canadian. I mean, we're you know, <laughs> sort of looked at as sort of a not very litigious society, but in this area in particular, like I said, in the last couple of years, it's been a, a huge uptick uh, based on some of that law that's emerged on the harm issue. I think for the underwriters in the room, you might want to amend your underwriting guidelines after uh, listening to Alex, let you know that maybe the environment isn't as good as we had originally, uh, originally had thought. Um, I have two more topics that I want to talk about. This one could go really quickly because I don't know if, if there's much debate here. Um, FTC Wyndham, are we all in agreement that the FTC now is the you know, they're the big enforcer out there of, of, of data breaches. Is there any debate left in that issue for anybody? I think the FCC, you know, you know so there, there is an interesting um, bureaucratic jurisdiction battle right now between the FC, FCC and the FTC. Um, and I think it's coming up, you know, in, uh, the, you know, one of the recent events that happened last week. And I believe, you know, at, at IAPP there was a discussion about uh, between the FCC and the FTC and that they're going to play well together and don't worry you're not going to get abused because there's two big people with big sticks coming in to beat you up. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, so, you know, so I guess it depends on how you ask the question. I think there's still some uncertainty as to when, when your client um, has an event, which regulators are going to have to deal with, right? Um, I think in terms of the arguments that were posed in Wyndham and, and LabMD, which is the question of whether the FTC has um, jurisdiction under Section 5 to bring an unfairness claim. So there's actually this development that there has to be consumer harm, redressability, causation. So a lot of the same standing issues we've been talking about here, there was a challenge as to whether the FTC, you know, had that type of harm. You know, I, there, there, you know it's another one of those cases where bad law makes, you know, bad case, bad facts make bad law. But you know, I don't see too many other companies willing to spend the time and the energy and effort to litigate that issue further. I don't know what you think. I, I mean, I don't think there's a question that the FTC is the main player. The question <coughs> is how the FT FCC is going to impact that. Yeah. And, and that, I, I don't have a prediction there. Okay. I, and I don't want to be the guinea pig. No. <laughs> I had a feeling that one was going to go pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> The, the last one, we do want to look over the horizon a little bit, uh, talked about the Internet of Things a little bit, and the, the, uh, the FTC, again, uh, re released some recommendations recent, uh, early this year, um, giving companies some guidance on um, you know, keeping con uh, consumer data, data safe on devices that are connected to the Internet. And, and I guess the question uh, for the panel is, um, is there you know, is there a next front for privacy litigation and enforcement actions coming out of the Internet of Things? Uh, again, uh, that's really for anybody. I figure John would say yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I appreciate you know, I, being asked to speak to so, you all. 
I really do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the reality is, is that um, business functionality gets ahead of security. I mean, and anytime you have, anytime you have tech, not, you know, anytime you have a, a new business, a new business model, the emphasis is on, you know, getting that product to market, bringing in revenue, and security is often an afterthought. And even um, in the biggest companies where, you know, so, revenues are generated in the billions, like in uh, Home Depot, our complaint alleges a tremendous amount of um, warning to upper management, and yet those changes which were being um, suggested, recommended, uh, just fell on deaf ears. So I think uh, companies need to spend more money uh, protecting their uh, the information that they get from my clients. Yeah, but, you know, so the, the easy, you know, the more sexy one is the Jeep, right? I get questions all the time about the, the Jeep hack. Um, and so just to put my comment in context, I'm sure somebody said, well, it, it'd be a great idea to connect the, um, you know, the, the automobile systems to the Wi-Fi in the media system in the car because then we could send diagnostic data via the wireless back to, you know, the home home office, right? And doesn't that sound like great fun business functionality? It makes it really easy to figure out how well our Jeeps are driving and if they're doing well, are people changing the oil on time, how does that affect performance, blah, 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 right? But nobody thought, well, why would the media system with Wi-Fi, why should that ever ha have any connection to the systems? And what are the security, um, pro you know, what security should we have in there so if somebody hacks into the system, they can't take over control of the car? It's a perfect example of, it doesn't seem like that complicated of a question, um, but, you know, having done this for a number of years, it's not a question that's asked often, and it really goes back to the point that I was trying to make before and been making a while, is we've got to be, you know, so I don't think John disagrees with this, if we did a better job being prepared before the event happens, um, we're, we're a less sexy target for plaintiff's counsel to come after. I, mean, I, would, I would think that's generally true. It is um, true. And yeah. isn't it better for the consumer overall if, we're, if we have good sound you know, information security practices in place to begin with. Absolutely. <clears throat> Here, we're going to open it. We have eight more minutes or so. Questions, please. You had yours already. You asked two already. How about over here? <coughs> Go ahead, yeah. You're going to be in a better place if the client's actually following what they've implemented. Um, you know, from from that perspective, if you're if you're drafting a policy, if you're training people, if you're utilizing those policies, if you're utilizing best practices, then yes, you're going to be in a better position because, frankly, those policies have worked the way they're supposed to because they're increasing awareness. You've got folks in the organization that are noticing things, asking the right questions, asking the questions before and not after, and actually putting the practices in place. What you don't want is a policy and procedure that has a whole bunch of parameters in it that your folks aren't following, because I can guarantee you John's going to find a way to ask a whole lot of questions about what you said you were going to do, but you didn't do. Um, and so that's the fine line, is you want it to be something effective that, it, that is implemented and that's actually followed by an organization. But the fact, the first step is actually doing it, and because that increases your awareness at, at, out of the gate. But, you know, it's a great question, because I think, you know, one of the things that I've been noodling through and thinking about is what are the standards that are out there right now? So it, there, there's really two questions, right? So, you know, one is having the right policies and procedures in place. Um, and then having good governance structure to make sure you do that. But are, you know, where's, where, where are the standards that I can point out to, you know, that I can point to when I'm in litigation with John and say, you know, we've done what's required uh, and we're doing it uh, and foreclose John, you know, I'm just picking on John, but no, you know, plaintiff's counsel from being able to say, well, you should have done X plus. You know, that's just the baseline, you should have done more. And I, and I will say as a litigator, I was always terrified of standards, right? Because I was always afraid that you know, we're going to fall below it, you're, you know, you're negligent per se, equivalent, you know, if you get above it, then you're still not safe. But, but I've, you know, I've been changing my thinking on that in, in, in part because we're not litigating the issue of standards. And I think eventually in the B2B litigation, 
that's where we're most likely to start litigating this question of have they done sufficient security. And I think, you know, OCR is in the process of writing some standards. Um, you know, NIDA, NIST, I'm sorry, NIST, um, ISO, there's some good standards out there. Um, it, but it's a matter of creating that law that says that, you know, if you do that, you're safe. There are, it, are two decisions in Canada, I can tell you, on this issue. One from the commissioner and one from the courts, which have um, just held that there's no liability where you've um, put in place the proper due diligence. So breach does not translate into breach of either the statutory obligation or liability uh, in tort or But Canada otherwise. does so. have, you know, standards defined. Statutorily standards defined. Yeah. Meyer has. Sorry, what was the question? He, he, he's just, just oh, restated. The, there, are, there are two, there are actual decisions on this issue in Canada where liability has been denied. So, so if you meet the Canadian, Canadian the, there's a Canadian statute that says these, this is what you have to ha do to have a good data security plan. Right. Right. And so if you've met that, the courts have said you're safe. Go ahead, Randy. I just wonder if the panel had any projections about the products cases that will come up from the connectivity of uh, you know, devices or um, cars to the internet, because those become products liability cases down the road, and that's a much, much stricter standard, which John is going to jump up and down and have an easy time to mitigate, because you know, the negligence standard isn't going to be targeted, it's much harder to establish the standard Oh, it's coming. We uh, there are a number of uh, think tanks yeah, but what uh, that f are formed by uh, coalitions of lawyers who do what I do, and my own law firm has over 300 lawyers, uh, almost 300 lawyers, that do plaintiffs' work, uh, mainly in the South and in New York, and we have a big products liability mm -hmm. practice. We're looking at it, and so we're refining how cases we're are work. coming. Oh, absolutely. So, I, I, yeah, I think the pro I think there's two issues. One is that. It took two years to hack into the Jeep case, which means that that's a lot of time and energy. And, and right now, the greatest threats, um, putting aside terrorism, you know, the greatest threat is um, organized crime. I mean, where's the money in forcing people to crash? Now, there might, you know, it, it might be easier than taking the guy out in the back alley and beating him with a stick and putting him in the trunk, um, <laughs> you know, if you're organized crime. But I, there's not really any money in that. Uh, so, you know, I, I'll be interested to see how much, you know, on the one hand, it's great media, it's really interesting. On the, and, I, and I will say that it's important um, to raise the visibility for people, you know, for companies to take cybersecurity more seriously. I don't see, I don't see car hacks and accidents being something that's going to happen with much frequency or, you know, in the near future, but. Well, what about medical devices? Well, that's, yeah. You know, so. It's a, let me just, everybody knows this story, or, or they should, you know, the, um, uh, Target hack uh, began with a 16-year-old boy in Eastern Europe who came up with the uh, program and was paid $1,000 to get into Target. So if you can imagine, you know, if, it's, if it can be imagined, it is possible and it will happen. And the, the very same thing you just raised, we're looking at it because we're trying to get on the other side of, of, of the issue before it happens and be prepared when it does. Okay, so one, one more question. Rennie? Yeah. Earlier you discussed about Article 3 standing, and I'm interested in your opinion on the implications of the um, Spokio Robbins case that the Supreme Court is dealing a uh, hearing uh, because of those being statutory damages and the fight over whether or not you have to prove uh, any actual harm in the field. What's going to happen? So I'd prefer that case not to be up there. Um, uh, I. Um, believe the decision can be answered without getting into some of the issues that we're concerned about. Um, you know, this, there are a number of uh, TCPA uh, cases where the fact that there's a violation and uh, a, a call uh, means $500 or 15 if it's willful. The fact is I, I think the case can be resolved on a very narrow basis. The problem is the Supreme Court doesn't always do that. Um, I personally believe that OPM is a game changer. I think those justices uh, all should be concerned. I had a case called Fidelity Federal versus Kehoe, another 
uh, case under the Drivers Protection Privacy Act that Ron and I uh, were involved in. He was not in this case. And the case went to the 11th Circuit and was actually the turning point for us to be able to resolve the case that Ron and I were involved in. And after the 11th Circuit determined that case, and that was a little bit different though. No, no, but here, the, this, this, this is the point. It went up on cert, and Justice Scalia said in so many words, I can't wait for this case to come up before me so that I can you know, slap down these plaintiff's lawyers in the billions of dollars they want to seek. Within a couple of years, a professor at George Mason told his class, go out and see what you can find about Justice Scalia on the internet. And he was upset when, when it was publicly released that his information in that amount was out there. OPM, to, to me, was the aha moment of the federal judiciary. That's not going to be lost on the Supreme Court of the United States. I think Spokio is going to be a limited ruling, and they're not going to open up the door to look at Article III standing in a way that would help those of you in the room. I don't know. It's going to be so. I do a lot of Fair Credit Reporting Act litigation, and that's actually what Spokio arose out of was the, a question of whether Spokio was offering a consumer report product, um, and and so the issue really is whether Congress can create, but by statute, an injury. So if, you know, you following what I'm saying. So even though there's no any actual harm. You know, putting that issue aside that we've been talking about in terms of Neiman Marcus, whether Congress can pass a statute and say, even if there's not been actual harm, can I create Article III standing? Can I create an injury to satisfy Article III standing? Um, and it's, <clears throat> so it has implications um, not within the context that we've been talking about in terms of Neiman Marcus. It has uh, relevance in terms of statutory claims. And, and a lot of attorneys on the plaintiff's bar, I've noticed, are trying to shoehorn in FCRA claims in their complaint. Uh, mainly because you get around that standing and damage issue. Because the other thing that happens under the FCRA is if there's a willful violation, you're automatically entitled to $100 to $1,000 per person. And we've seen that a lot in FCRA class action litigation being a very destructive tool, I think, on the industry for, you know, little things, that, is, things as little as, you know, on the consent for authorization to run an employment background screen, you have any other language on there other than that consent. I mean, you know, employers have been getting sued all over the place on that issue, uh, and they, you know, and they've been being a, they've been able to get class certification in a lot of those cases. And it's, you know, so uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what the Supreme Court does with Spokio. Um, you know, I think both both sides on the issue are uncertain as to how the court's going to come down, and and it's I do think that it's going to be an important ruling. I can't. I'm not going to predict how it's, you know, may, maybe later tonight we have a couple of drinks. I'll, I'll tell you how I think it's going to come out, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you how, right here on this panel that's being reported how I think it's going to come out. So I think our time's up. Um, I, I want to thank our panelists that they did a fantastic job. Um, I do want to make one, one recommendation. If, if you guys like TV shows about hackers and computers yeah. and what can go wrong, Mr. Robot. check out Mr. Robot <laughs> on USA. It's a great Mr. show. Mr. Robot's awesome. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs>